some 4,000 years ago, the first men started hunting with birds of prey in order to catch food. So it's a specialised method of hunting for game, where you use a trained hawk or a trained falcon to catch other birds and animals with. And of course, our need for food was great, meaning that our reliance upon these creatures was equally important. So that in a nutshell is why there is so much falconry in our human history, because it was literally necessary for the survival of many people. Now the art of falconry came to Britain during the Dark Ages, which is that period just after the Romans disappeared. And back then it was known as a barbarian sport, a rather military style activity that was more closely associated with the warring tribes in the East. Over there, the hawk was a symbol of power and might, and hunting with a hawk, apart from being a way of harvesting food, was a form of military training. And so, when it first came here to Britain, we were a little hesitant to adopt it. But once we understood the advantages that it brought, it didn't take long for the popularity of falconry to increase. And that happened during the Saxon period, because our Saxon kings poured their time, and more importantly, their money, into the expansion of English falconry. They are the first to create a falconry department within the royal household, and to employ royal hawkers and falconers to do all of that work for them. When the Normans invaded, and of course conquered, they took over that particular organisation, and they built on it further expanding it and introducing the concept of cavalry to falconry. So we started hunting from horseback with our hawks. And that continued to build over the following centuries until we get to the golden age of hawking, which were the 13th, the 14th and the 15th centuries. And those just happened to be the periods when this castle was at its busiest and most thriving. Which is why there were hawks and falcons housed right here at Annick Castle. And they would have been here to fill the kitchen larders with feathered and furry game. And of course to provide Lord and Master with sport and outdoor entertainment. Now symbolically, a bird of prey was something very proud and very regal. And that's why we see lots of our noble houses in history using this in their family um, heraldry and wearing them as personal badges and motifs because amongst their own kind the bird of prey is the prince of all birds and therefore you could use it to reflect your status and your position. They were valuable assets costing between two and four pounds to purchase which was almost as much as a knight would earn as his annual salary so these were not affordable to the majority of the population and therefore if you had one you wanted to shout loud and proud about its possession. Hawking, the art of hunting with a hawk species, was a rather domestic and servile function. It involved this type of bird and catching food on a daily basis for the larder. But falconry, well that was more high status. It was outdoor, it was social and it was something that you did for pleasure and for enjoyment. So really, depending upon what you were hunting for and why you were hunting, you would hunt with a very specific type of bird. Now the hawk that you're watching in rather casual flight at the moment is uh, a South American species known as the Harris hawk or the bay-winged hawk. That's kind of irrelevant because a hawk is a hawk the world over. They're de defined by a long tail, which they use as a rudder and of course is braking and a relatively narrow wingspan in, in comparison because they're woodland birds. They're designed to maneuver easily around and through obstacles. They have a high predatory instinct, so of course they're good for hunting. And like a knight or a soldier, they have big guns, heavy artillery, and that comes in the form of large feet. So when we're choosing a hunting bird, we don't look at the size of the bird's body, or the length of its wings, or the colour of its feathers, because that really means very little. We look at its artillery, and if that bird has big feet in relation to its body size, then we know it's going to be a good hunter. So, this hawk is an exceptional hunter, 
you could catch partridge and duck and pheasants and rabbits and all sorts of things with this one single hunting bird. And that's why it was the best bird to catch food for the table. And it's also why the hawk became known as the cook bird or the kitchen hawk. Because of course that was its function. I am watching my husband exercising Hydra, our seven-year-old female hawk at the moment. She is very obliging in winging back and forth from wall to perch to fist. You get the impression that she's trained, that she's tamed, that she's sociable and domesticated. But don't be fooled by this illusion because none of those things can be achieved with a bird of prey. They are solitary, predatory animals. They're non-intelligent. They have no affection, no emotional capacity, and really they have no need for humans because they're quite capable of looking after themselves. So why does a bird of prey choose to fly to a man? Well, it's not because he likes the man, because the hawk physically can't feel that sentiment. What it does is it views man as an easy kill, food that is guaranteed and to which the hawk does not have to give chase. And in any predator's book, that is a good meal. So she is simply using Mike, and we're quite fine with that, because it means we can use her as a tool, and in return she gets care and keep for free. Now what that means is that she's got no bond to an individual, no affection for one particular human. And that is why we are able to invite a few of you out what? to come and have a flight with the hawk, because she will happily mug any of you for a free meal. <laughs> so who would like to be mugged by a hawk this afternoon? I'm sure there are a few willing people out there. Shall we have the little girl in the pink coat with a very long stretchy arm that went up like a bolt of lightning? Would you like to have a flight, young lady? Yes, please, she said. Hello there. Pop the glove on your left hand oh, for me. Goodness. That's where we lure her over. Are you in? Lovely. That goes there. Turn around half a circle. Super. Extend your arm in front of your body and Hydra will do the best. There you go. That's a very good pose. Let's give this young lady a round of applause. She gazes happily upon those big feet that I was just talking about. And they are big, aren't they? when they're that close to your face. Well done, young lady. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Right, who else would like a flight with our hawk? Shall we come and get you set up for your flight as well? Left hand, if you could be so kind. Thank you very much. Another little morsel of meat. That goes there. A straight, strong arm. And Hydra is on her way. Lovely. Big round of applause. <laughs> And a nice smile, watching make a good picture. And you can see that Hyde is very happy to do this. There's no delay, she's not thinking about it. Oh, free food, that's good. Thank you very much. And that means that there is time and space in her crop for just one more flight. So shall we have a last person from the bottom end of the arena? Shall we? There's a lady under an umbrella on there who's tentatively got her hand raised. Let's have an adult, why not? Come into the arena, madam, and you can have the last flight. And I'm afraid you have to come to me, because what little wind we have today means that we're working her upwind, which is how she has best control on the wing. Hi there, pop that on your left hand, if you would. Our final little offering. There she is, watching over Mike's shoulder. Extend your arm. Lovely job, there we go. Perfect. And our final round of applause. And hopefully point demonstrated that these birds, like my husband, are all about the food. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Now it's really important that you understand how a well waxed car underneath and on top, this bird is not getting wet. The reason I can do this and the reason I can find my birds and go hunting in the rain is because one thing only, I never ever touch my birds. In 42 years of being a falconer, I have never stroked any of my birds. Because if you stroke a bird of prey, you take the oils off, which means they absorb water. But the worst thing is, they work at 42 degrees, and it means that they get cold spots on the body. So when we sadly don't go and stroke an owl to death, it's exactly right. 
An owl was struck a dozen times at a game and country fair will die of pneumonia. But because it's only 50 quid bird, they can go to buy another one and you can pay a pound a stroke and they can earn another thousand pounds the next day. So even though you think you're doing kind, birds gain nothing from being touched. They don't even preen each other. They have a preen gland at the base of the back, they preen that slightly small piece of oil off and preen it into the feathers. And as you can see, with Hydra there, which is why we're able to do this show, the water just runs off like a well-waxed heart. If you learn nothing else from our display this afternoon, please take that with you. And if somebody offers you a bird to stroke, please, please, please do not do it. You really are doing the bird the most unkind. Anyway, we now move on to a very different type of raptor, a member of the owl family. Is your owl, and a rather beautiful little owl at that, who is, as you can see, as good on her feet as she is with her wings in the air. This is Zai Zai. She is an African spotted eagle owl and 18 years old. So she's a very accomplished and experienced lady. Now bring an owl out here, everybody goes, oh, it's an owl, because we love owls, don't we? Who doesn't? They're beautiful, enchanting, endearing little creatures. But that is not what our ancestors thought about owls in history. In fact, it was quite the opposite. If they saw this nighttime bird during the boldness of daytime, they would be terrified, and they would make the sign of the cross over their chest to protect themselves from evil, because that's what the vision of an owl brought them. This was not a highly respected, highly revered creature like the hawk was, because this is a bird from the underworld, a bird that comes to us from the realm of darkness. And in history, anything associated with dark was of course equally associated with evil. So you are looking at a messenger of the devil, Satan's own prophet. And I know that sounds ridiculous. Sounds like a fairy story, but it is absolutely true. The problem with the owl is that before we were able to see in the dark, i.e. street lighting and electric torches, we couldn't go out into the night and learn and see things. We took things at face value but we never got to see the face of the owl. We only ever heard it while we were tucked up in bed at night time. And let's face it, owls don't make the prettiest of noises. They scream, they hiss, they hoot, they twit twoo. They make a cacophony of noises, but none of them are particularly pleasant. And so you would lay in bed listening to these strange noises coming from goodness knows what outside of your window with your imagination running complete riot. And that is why there are so many myths and superstitions about owls all around the world, because for most of us, they were a complete mystery. You certainly wouldn't have seen somebody handling and flying and exercising an owl like I'm doing today. Good grief, they'd not want to put their hands upon this evil creature. The creature that, of course, was considered to be the familiar of the witch. A sorcerer or a shapeshifter who could change its shape and skulk about in the shadows at night time. And of course their power of vision, enabling them to fly in the dark, well that was thought to be black magic and nobody wanted that at all. If you were a farmer and you had famine or failed harvest or flood or pestilence, you'd blame it on the presence of a local owl and you would hunt that poor bird down you would kill it, skin it, and hang its coat of feathers upon your barn door. And you'd leave it there for a good seven days, after which you would burn it to ash and throw the ashes in a fast-flowing river. It's here. <laughs> and that was done to rid yourself of evil influence, because, again, the presence of this bird brought with it bad luck. It was the bird of omen, the bird of death, and many of our historic characters were allegedly foretold their own deaths by seeing one of these creatures. Julius Caesar, good example, foretold his death by a barn owl sitting on the roof of a temple through which he passed. And our most legendary, 
if not beloved king, Richard III, is said to have been born to the screech of an owl, which is why, why his life was so plagued and why he came to a rather sticky end. It's here and not there. There we go. Now, as you can see, don't have the best vision. And that's because, unlike their daytime counterparts, these birds don't hunt by sight. They are designed very differently to the diurnal birds. These hunt by sound. And you can tell that just by looking at the profile of an owl. They're rounded, they're soft, they're fluffy. They have a facial disc. In this case, we have ear tufts, and all of that is about noise, because an owl hunts by listening for things and not for looking for them. So she has a facial disc, which absorbs sound and helps to finally funnel it into her ear slit at the side of her facial disc. She has dense, deep, soft, fluffy feathers that don't make any noise when they move through the air. And because, of course, she has no friction and no noise, she can creep up silently and catch her prey, which she does at night time, because night time is quieter than daytime. And so everything about this bird is designed to be efficient and effective under the cover of night. And that, of course, is all the information that our medieval ancestors didn't know. And perhaps if they did, they might have had a slightly different attitude towards our nighttime friends, who, with the benefit of modern science today, we are very warm and welcoming towards them because we appreciate them. Science has broken open the mysteries of this bird, and that's a really good thing. Um, it means that we value them, we find a place for them within our hearts, and hopefully that means that we'll have many owls for, for years and years to come. And of all the owls that I fly, Zai here is my absolute favourite because, as I said, she's 18, I've had her all her life, and she is as responsive flying to me as she is the hawk. And that's unusual with an owl because when you fly them at demonstration, you have, of course, a cloud talking, you have a booming PA in the background, and that, of course, interferes with the owl's ability to hear. So they're often very slow to respond and quite a lot of time you'll see people flying owls without actually moving at all. But I here, over the years of working with her, has learned to not listen for me anymore but to look for me. And it's rather helpful that I'm always adorned in a big frock because it makes me pretty easy to pick out. And that shows you just how adaptable these rather fantastic little creatures are. So, there is the secret story of the owl, and I think that was a lovely little flight slash sprint by Zai here. So please give Madam a little round of applause. Bravo! Right, we're done. Yes, we are. With a hunt, because what is better than that? So you go to these displays and you see people winging birds backwards and forwards and when they don't come to the glove instantly you all have a laugh because you think the bird doesn't want to come back to the handler. Well, the bird cannot want to come back to the handler because it's a bird. Uh, it's a non-intelligent creature but that doesn't decry it in any way because it works purely on instinct. It's been around for 65 million years which is 10 times longer than us and with our super intelligence look at the mess that we've made. <laughs> so when we're out hunting with our birds, we're not flying the birds back and forth to the glove. In fact, when I'm getting the birds back to the glove on a day out hunting, well, it's not really a good day because it's mean we're not seeing a lot. All I want to be doing is picking my bird up off the kill once he's actually taken something. So we put the bird in the tree, we get the dog working underneath and we do a nice line of trees and hopefully the dog will flush something for the bird to come in and catch it. And then hopefully, if I find the bird, which I should be able to do if, we're, uh, if we've got the bells on and the tracking system on, then we can uh, pick the bird off the kill, all go home, the bird gets something, and I get something too. And so does the dog, so everybody's happy. So what we're going to do now is set up this chase. And uh, for that, we need a member of you, the audience. Right, who shall we have? I need somebody small, somebody brave, somebody fast. Soon. Who ticks all of those boxes, I wonder? There's a lot of smiley, beady, keen, rather desperate looking little faces out there. 
So how do I possibly choose? Lots of parents trying to get rid of their children. Look, <laughs> I think I'm See? going to have the little chap in green over there. Come under the rope, young sir. Head towards me, and we shall reveal your role in the show. Right then, what's your name? Ned, nice to meet you, Ned. Could you come towards this wooden stick and pick it up off the floor? Could you then turn and face that tower in the corner? Have you seen a show before, Ned? You have, so you know what you're going to do. And you're still volunteered to do it. Crazy. Right, little Ned here is going to provide us with something to hunt with the hawk. So Ned is going to bring to life Percival, our stunt pheasant. He is going to do that by running like a galloping gazelle, Ned, across the arena here. And hopefully from the wall, the hawk is going to put in a steaming hard pace. So when Ned begins running, let us give him a clap and a cheer, and we'll see far, how far he gets before Hydra the Hawk buries. <laughs> Are you ready, Ned? Go! Off he goes, in comes the hawk, in pursuit, streaming down, is she going to catch him? Yes, of course she is. Let's give Ned a big round of applause. Oh, look at him. He's exhausted. <laughs> you need to chair somebody quick. Ned, that was a good job. It was downhill, so you got a good lick of speed up there. And as a thank you for your speed and your bravery, I'm going to present you with a small gift. It is your own freshly laid hawk egg, which is called Kinder. And I wish you very good <laughs> luck with him. Thank you very much. Kinder chocolate egg. egg. <laughs> And using a lure like that is exactly how we train our hawks to hunt for real. This is a pheasant lure. You can see that it has been garnished with the wings and the tail of a real pheasant that no longer needs them. But if I wanted to train my hawk to chase duck, I would put duck wings on the lure. And if I wanted my hawk to chase rabbits or hares, I would put fur on the lure. And so you see, you can custom create a perfect hunting bird, which saves you time, and saves you money in the hunting field, and only brings back the goods that you want. So, a perfectly evolved creature, and the perfect hunting tool. And that draws our demonstration to a rather soggy end. So I hope you've enjoyed meeting our feathered family and learning all about their place in history. Thank you for watching.